from Microbe TV. This is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 32, recorded on June 19th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Utah, Nels Eldi. Greetings from Eldi Lab Studio. Really nice to be with you this afternoon. Seems like forever. Yeah, once a month, is uh, there's a little bit of time between recordings. It's long enough so that the weather here has turned summery. <laughs> mm. 20, 31 Celsius and sunny. Completely sunny, no no clouds. What do you got over there? Well, we were running pretty hot the last week or two. The first real pulse of summer came through, but today is um, not shabby. It's about 75 on the Fahrenheit scale, and a few puffy clouds, really nice. Want to bring in your guest, Nels? Yeah, I do. So um, it is really a fun honor to introduce Professor Matt Hahn from the Department of Biology and Computer Science at Indiana University. Welcome, Matt. Hello. Glad to be here. You have one of the best Twitter handles I've seen. <laughs> I, I was amazed that it was available when I <laughs> went to get it. Third the funny thing is that I also I had to sign up for a Gmail account uh, last week, and it was available on Gmail as well. So now I'm branded well, across multiple platforms. It's it's clear nobody wants to be the third reviewer. Yeah. <laughs> and and now we can all say that Matt is the third reviewer mm. of my grant of my paper, whatever it might be. <laughs> I I get a lot of grief for that. <laughs> it's only true like fifty percent of the time too. That's the problem. Why did you choose that handle? And is there anything behind that, or just was kind of curious? There's nothing behind it. Um, actually, the, originally it came from that. Is it the downfall um, parody? Um, it's I can't remember maybe the exact name. It's a it's a movie about Hitler in the bunker, and many people have dubbed over lots of funny oh. scenarios on the yeah yeah I know like two minute yeah. scene in that movie. And there's a great one of where Hitler complains about the third reviewer. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Kind of a classic if you haven't seen it. I think I've seen that, yeah. Good meme, I guess, in the early yep. days of memes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I want to tell you about the microbiology department at Icon School of Medicine. They are seeking faculty candidates interested in strengthening their program and virus host interactions. Applicants must hold a PhD and or MD, have postdoctoral experience, and be interested in creating a virus-related research group that will complement the pre-existing departmental programs. Recruitment of individuals or couples at the level of assistant, associate, or full professor will be considered. More information about the department and the school can be found at icon.mssm.edu. If you want to apply, send your CD and a brief, <laughs> send your CV, <laughs> no more CDs, <laughs> and a brief description of your research plan to nycvirology at gmail.com, or you can contact Ben Tenover directly. What are we doing today, Nels? Yeah, well, so we're going to cover um, a paper review, actually, that Matt wrote with a colleague, uh, Andrew Kern. Um, but before that, I would suggest, <clears throat> excuse me, that we, um, I'm going to actually steal a little phrase from the paper that we'll get into, we'll dig into in a few minutes here, but if we could take, um, Matt, if we could ask you to take a sojourn on, or tell us about your sojourn in academics, um, how did you get to the position where you are today? Um, I guess it was kind of roundabout. Um, yeah, I, I didn't go to college thinking I would work in evolution or especially population genetics, uh, but I had a great class uh, from Sarah Vaya, actually, um, an evolutionary biologist. And that kind of convinced me to do it. And she actually gave me my first lab job as well, counting aphids. <laughs> well, um, so th what college yeah. was that at? That was at Cornell. Oh, really? What years? Um, I was there from 95 to 98. <laughs> I was there from 70 to 74, a little bit earlier. <laughs> Probably wouldn't recognize it. 
Yeah, I, I went back recently and I almost didn't recognize it. I guess, you know, like all campuses, lots of building, lots of change. Yeah. Also, the faculty changes, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And Sarah left soon thereafter. So I actually didn't uh, end up doing more research with her, um, but uh, did a lot of research with Rick Harrison. Um, and that was a great experience and, and really convinced me to go on to grad school. So had you gone to college with the idea of going to medical school? No, not at all. I was, uh, you know, it's 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 very roundabout. I was a double major in Mech E and English when I started college. Wow. Um, and I, it's kind of because I knew engineering was boring and I wanted to get a little bit more excitement in my education. Uh, then I did a couple of internships in engineering and it really was too boring for me. Uh, so I just had to change. That's great. So you changed it was, it to was good. Uh, science. Yeah, it was yeah. it was yeah, it was good um preparation in terms of math and some computing, but that's about it. Where, where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? Uh I grew up in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Wow, not too far from me. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I I grew up about a, a mile from the entrance to Columbia. Hmm. That's cool. That's not we don't hear that very often, do we, Nels? <laughs> no, that's true. Not many people from. So where did you go to grad school after uh, Cornell? Uh, so I went to Duke for grad school with Mark Rauscher. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a really great move. I was actually a lab tech for a year in between at the American Museum on the Upper West mm. Side as well. Cool. Just doing DNA sequencing. Um, and then went to grad school uh, at Duke and then moved on to a postdoc at UC Davis. Now, um, speaking of Duke, I, uh, we interviewed... Yeah. Stacy Horner, this uh, past TWIV. Oh, you, nice. You so this her? is for the last this week in yeah. virology. And, I do. Stacy is an incredible. And scientist. she's from Minnesota. She is. All I, I, you know, have staked the claim on several occasions that all <laughs> <laughs> great scientists uh, emerge from Minnesota. You know what the funny thing is? It's been you and her, and also some others. And they say, I went to a small college in Minnesota. Everyone in Minnesota went to some small college. There seemed to be a lot of them. <laughs> Yeah, a little echo maybe of that East Coast yeah. um, style of small uh, liberal arts schools. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, the one I went to, we like to call ourselves the Harvard of Minneapolis or something mm, like that. But I forgot which one hers was. But um, Matt, you uh, went from then Davis to Indiana, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Thirteen years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you miss? Uh, well, let me put it this way: after growing up in New York, how is it to be in Indiana? Okay. I, I really love Bloomington. So I, you know, I walk mm -hmm. to work. I can walk my kids to school. There's lots of good coffee and food. Mm. Um, it's a nice area to be in. And, you know, I've lived in so many college towns that I've gotten used to that kind of lifestyle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and really appreciate it. I, I, I like going back and visiting New York and seeing my parents and other relatives. But uh, I, I think it would be hard to be an academic there. Mm. I uh, I had a great visit. I have to tell you, I um, they they took me out to some great places for food, and one of the students drew a picture of me as a commemoration of my visit, which is lovely. It's me with a cardinal sitting on my shoulder. Wow! <laughs> and it's in front of the gates there at the at the entrance, right? Yeah, sample <laughs> gates. The IU. It's really nice. And then he drew. A picture of every organism that is worked on in the department. A lot of viruses and organisms and uh, bacteria and so forth. It was really nice. I got it on my wall here, looking at it. So fun memories of it. Went to an Afghan restaurant. You ever go to that one? Oh yeah, sure, Samira. Uh, yeah, it's a great place. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I'm um, also a huge fan of Indiana University. And just the public universities across the country in general, <clears throat> land grant universities. I mean, mm -hmm. all of this diversified energy in academics spread out across the country. It's really, I think, one of the great things about science uh, as we practice it in the U.S. So I left on an early Saturday morning, and I was waiting. I stayed at that hotel right on your campus there. It's like part of the union or something. Yeah. Like right. <clears throat> Staying outside about 7 a.m. waiting for a car. And all these people in red sweaters are coming in to start tailgating <laughs> for the football game. <laughs> Not sure I could take, and they say uh, Saturday just stay away from campus whenever. You know that's that's actually <laughs> unusual for our campus. We're not very good at football, <laughs> um, but we do like tailgating. 
Okay. I've actually been tailgating, <laughs> but I've never been inside a football game. Okay. That's so. probably that's probably where you should cut it off. Just go Yeah, maybe go that eat. tells you something. <laughs> go eat and go back to the lab, yeah. <laughs> That's a good call. So Matt, and then when you so when you made that transition from graduate work at Duke to um, Davis, tell us a little bit about that transition and who you were working with uh, at Davis. Um, so it's a funny transition because my partner finished her PhD a year before me and went to Davis, mm-hmm. and so it was kind of predecided that I would go there. But as a population geneticist, you know there was like a twenty five percent chance I would have been there anyway. <laughs> um, so I, I ended up going to work with uh, Chuck Langley and John Gillespie, um, but kind of on the floor they're in on, on in Storer Hall on the Davis campus, there's a whole bunch, and there still are a whole bunch of great scientists. Uh, at the time, it was uh, Michael Torelli and Dave Begun and um, Sergey Nuzhdin. And so, you know, Chuck and John were my official mentors, but I learned almost as much from the other people on that floor. And it was really an amazing place. Yeah, agree. Yep. And just to say, so your partner is Leonie Moyle. Uh, That's right. Very yeah. renowned population geneticist and scientist also at Indiana University. Yeah. So Leonie and I luckily got uh, faculty jobs at the same time at, at IU and moved here at the same time. It was great. It and worked out for us. Yeah. That's awesome. And you're saying that was about 13 years ago? That was. Yeah. So actually, we um, we got our jobs, I guess, 2004, and then we took another year as postdocs. And I think that was the best year, right? Mm-hmm. You have a job, all the psychological stress is gone, um, and you can just do a lot of research and have a little bit of fun, mm-hmm. but without mm-hmm. teaching, no teaching responsibilities or anything like that <laughs> as well. Absolutely. And maybe take us through a little bit more of the details under the hood of the solving what people call the two-body problem or um, the two-body opportunity and maybe spinning it slightly more positively. That's right. <laughs> um, I think we were... You know, both of us were in very similar fields in evolutionary biology, and so it wasn't much of a secret when we would go interview. And we actually interviewed, except for IU, at all different places. Hmm. So, you know, there was no great gnashing of teeth over whether we had to reveal something or let anybody know uh, that there were two of us. And I feel like it was an advantage because there were certain people who I could talk to who knew Leone's work and wanted her to be their colleague. Um and so I, I felt like in the end, it was a, a net positive for me because I gained from having that connection. And our department and our campus is actually quite good um, at two-body problems. So we have, I think right now, six faculty of equal rank in biology. Mm-hmm. And in computer science, it's something like three or four. Um, so it, it may just be um, part of being in, in Indiana and in Bloomington. There aren't a whole lot of other industries, and so they're especially attentive to that kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's great. And I'd say some echoes of that over here on the Wasatch front in Salt Lake City, the University of Utah is sort of the one academic game in town. And so you see some of the same strategies emerging or same opportunities emerging as well. Yeah. That's right. And I think in general, it's a net positive for the department as well. You get lots Absolutely. of people who get very invested in the department. Yep. I 100% agree. If you, so don't, Matt, if, if you don't want to be in the same place as your partner, you can always come to a city like New York where we have, you know, a dozen institutions. <laughs> your partner could be across town if you want. <laughs> True. The separation of church and state. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, Leone and I are on different floors, so that's... It's probably good enough. <laughs> yeah, that's good enough. Because here I don't go to another floor. <laughs> Very rarely. Sorry to interrupt you, Matt. I mean, no, not I, at all. I, no. So I was just going to say, so Matt, one of the reasons that we um, also wanted to get you on Twivo today, it was um, to mention that you just published a new book on molecular population genetics. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. How did you come to be an author? Um, yeah, so actually I wrote a, another book 10 years ago, um, mm-hmm. or it got mostly written, came out 10 years ago, it got mostly written a little bit before that. But in fact, with somebody else from Davis, um, that book was on computational genomics and it was with a statistical a statistician, computational person at Davis, Nello Cristianini, and it was a really great experience. Um, mm. I learned a lot from Nello, and that was when I was getting into bioinformatics and machine learning. And the book was an opportunity kind of to write up what I had been learning. This book is more what I know and what I work on. Uh, so in that sense, it's uh, a bit more satisfying. Um, and mostly I wrote it because there's not another book 
in this field, which is crazy, right? It's a huge field. It's been going for 40 plus 50 years. Um, and there isn't really a book that tells you how to analyze DNA sequences in a population context. Mm -hmm. And were you just sort of drawing from scratch here, or could you sort of lean on all of your experience teaching a lot of these topics as well? Yeah, so I, I started it uh, after I taught a grad class twice. So I had my notes uh, from that. And I you, that was also what made me realize I couldn't find a textbook to use for that class. And I had to piece together review papers and the chapter from other textbooks here and there. Um, so really, it, it sprung out of my notes. And now I feel quite badly. I, you know, I, I can remember I had a professor in college who, as we would say, we taught, he taught out of his book. And, and, you know, at the time, I think as an undergrad, you're like, oh, this is terrible. You wrote a book and then you just recite from it. Mm -hmm. But of course, he must have just had his notes, right? And that's what he taught. And he wrote down those words in a book. And so I think as an undergrad, I had the causality backwards. Uh, but yeah, this really did come out of a grad class. Mm -hmm. And that, who would you say is that the target audience for molecular population genetics? Is it a early graduate student, different levels? How, how wide yeah, I would, what? I would say that my the real focus, the people I was trying to write it for were first year grad students who would come into my lab. And you'd want to say, here, learn this first and see if it, you know, brings to mind any questions or we'll just use it as kind of a baseline and, and we can go from there. But of course, it can, it can be used in that same kind of sense of exploration by people at any stage who just are getting into this field. But you know some of the background. So I don't cover a lot of the basics of population genetics. There's lots of good uh, textbooks for that. Mm -hmm. um, but it builds upon those. Yeah, so I think that's a nice transition maybe into actually to the paper that we're thinking about today that recently came out um, with you and Andy Kern. And so just to maybe set the table a little bit. So, you know, on Twivo, um, we spend a lot of time sort of exploring the contours of what's emerging in evolutionary biology, given sort of all of the new flood of data from sort of genome scale uh, experiments that are um, out there. A lot of the topics we think about usually uh, also involve sort of intermingling this with experimental approaches. Um, but I think it's also, you know, really clear that the genome era, of course, is having an impact everywhere, including on population genetics. And in fact, here, in some ways, you might argue that it, it could have the greatest impact of all, just sort of actually adding real data to some of the theoretical frameworks or the mathematical approaches or quantitative approaches to thinking about our genetics. And so that, I think, is a natural fit for us to sort of stretch a little bit here on Twivo and think about this paper. And so... Um, this is a recent review uh, called The Neutral Theory in the Light of Natural Selection. In fact, The Neutral Theory, um, I guess it celebrated um, its 50th anniversary. That might have been the occasion yep, for exactly. this co collection. Is that right? Yep. And um, and is, uh, as we'll see, is taking a few shots from you and, and Kern here. So maybe um, just to get started a, a little bit. Um, can you just give us a little bit of the background on how you, you guys came together to co-author this piece and sort of what was going on there? So that's a, actually a funny story. Um, a little funny. It's funny to me. Um, I wrote a, a, <laughs> another review 10 years ago, exactly, uh, mm -hmm. when really the first population genomic data sets had come out saying none of this fits the predictions of the neutral model. There's just nothing about the data that we're looking at um, that makes any sense. And so fast forward to earlier this year, and the journal Molecular Biology and Evolution was putting together a special issue in honor of the neutral theory, and the editor-in-chief asked me to write a review. And I said, you know, what is there to write that I, I didn't cover 10 years ago? Um, but Sudhir Kumar, the editor, said, well, think about it. And I mentioned this, that I maybe didn't want to write it to Andy. And Andy said, oh, no, we can find something to write about. There's plenty of new stuff. And so he joined as a co-author, and that's where it came out of. And actually, let me mention as well that Andy also grew up in Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, just across Central Park from me. <laughs> and I think we're about a, a year apart in age or so. But you didn't know him at the time. I did not know him, no. <laughs> that, you know that Central Park is a life line. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. So, and Andy, just to say, he's actually, well, his lab is nearby currently and um, where he grew up at Rutgers, if I'm remembering right. But isn't he transitioning now? Yeah, he will University be driving through Indiana next week on his way to the University of Oregon to start a new job. Mm. 
Yeah, interesting. Another, uh, Vincent, another great um, Twitter handle here, at Pastrami Machine. <laughs> That's great. He's making the right move, i, I got to say. Rutgers to, uh, <laughs> I mean, New Jersey. I mean, Rutgers may be okay for him, but New Jersey is not, uh, it doesn't, I think Oregon is much better, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Matt. I was actually half convinced that Andy's um, transition here was all a ruse just for him to go through uh, New York and sample pizza from various uh, <laughs> restaurants. It was all just sort of a made up <laughs> scenario. But he, you have you have it on good authority that he's actually migrating west. He's actually migrating west. Mm-hmm. In fact, I just graduated a PhD student who's going to go join him as a postdoc. He's my second PhD student who will join Andy as a postdoc. It's become uh-huh. a little pipeline. Building. Yeah, there you go. So and actually, I wanted to so. You know, and this it's a two author review with Andy first and you second. I did want to kind of we've talked a little bit about this um, in thinking about some evolutionary biology and studies how author order might be different from experimental kind of cell biology or virology labs. This came up, remember Vincent? So a couple episodes ago on um, driving Miss Maisie, <laughs> talking about maze knobs mm-hmm. and um, and um, chromosome drive. Yeah, it was great. Centromere drive, fun yeah, you know, fun paper on neo centromeres, but so. Um, Kelly Da, who is the first author on that paper and also the lead author, we were sort of debating like how is it that there is not a trainee there, or how how is it that people might become first or last authors, mm. um, and are there differences in different fields? Actually, so Kathy Spindler, co-host of Twiv, knows Kelly, and they did a little offline discussion, um, and I, I think um, Kelly was just saying that you know he'd been working on that project for a really long time, more than a decade from when he was a trainee to starting his lab and that that just sort of reflected that he has been trying to, he's just been slowly doing the work over mm. a long time. Yeah. What do you think, Matt? Did you see any of this in sort of evolutionary biology? Oh yeah. I mean, I think um, there's, there are definitely field specific norms for this kind of thing um, and, and big differences. And I think it also changes with stage, you know, your stage mm. and academic process I'm much more. I'm much happier to just be the last author on papers from my lab um, nowadays than mm-hmm. than first author. I think you know you have students and you want to give students more of the limelight, and and there's all sorts of incentives for putting them um, in that position and in the position to write the paper. But with two author papers, it's different. Sure. So actually, Andy and I we we published a two author paper previously, and that was Han and Kern. And I, I swear half of the decision this time was simply, hey, you know, novelty wise, we should just switch the order so we can refer to the papers without having to say which year. <laughs> there you go. Yep. So maybe let's um, dig in a little bit. And actually to start, maybe we should just define um, neutral theory, for example, neutral models and related just sort of concepts. This has come up on Twivo before. Remember, Vincent, we've had a few, I think, items in the mailbag. Um, yeah. For example, that's right. That's right. Asking about neutral theory, sort of in the light of um, Darwin's finches, the beaks, mm-hmm. and how and the natural selection that seems really kind of evident and charismatic. So, can we start there? Sure. Matt, and just kind of, yeah. So, um, the neutral theory. So, actually, this is fine. A mutation is neutral or not, mm-hmm. right? And it's, mm-hmm. it's neutral or advantageous or deleterious with respect to some other version of the DNA molecule. So when we say it's neutral, it means that the new allele, the new mutation version, uh, has the same exact fitness as the previous one. And the neutral theory says that most of the mutations you see, most of the differences you see among individuals and among species are neutral. So not that all mutations are neutral, but the lots of the deleterious ones you just never see, right? Those are selected out right away. And so really it's saying... You're not looking at mutations that are advantageous relative to the one they're replacing, or um, they're not slightly deleterious and just hanging around. They're not balanced polymorphisms. So it was really a statement about, you know, we see lots of differences between individuals. We see lots of uh, differences between different species. And most of those differences are simply neutral changes. Yeah, and I think that's an important point because I think a lot of molecular biologists sometimes uh, miss that meaning. So this just because neutral is so sort of word forward there that it's sort of a kind of seemingly intuitive idea, but there is a difference there. So our um, colleague Casey Bergman had a nice blog post on this. Um, He called this the neutral sequence fallacy, 
where you don't want to conflate selective neutrality and functional constraint. And yeah, so that's I, kind I of often, yeah. yeah, I point Crazy. people to Casey's post all the time, right? So neutrality neutral does not mean no selection. Mm -hmm. It just means there's an equivalence between two specific alleles. It doesn't mean all alleles are allowed. It means, you know, the two you're looking at are neutral with respect to each other. And so that's a lot different from there's no selection on this particular sequence or on some particular phenotype or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. So we'll put that link to Casey's um, blog post because I think it's that was really helpful for me um, as well. And actually, Matt, so why should we care? Why, why does any of this matter? I think we, we care because we want to know what's driving molecular differences. And we want to know what's driving that because, you know, those are what underlie the phenotypes. So it's actually quite hard to measure selection on phenotypes, especially phenotypes or, or selection that has happened in the past. And only really by looking at the molecules can you do that, right? You can say this trait arose because of positive selection, because there was an adaptation, you know, selection was fixing an allele that drove this trait. And you can't, it, you can do it a little bit with fossils, but it's really hard. And so with molecules, we can say, you know, these are the mutations that are under selection. And I think, you know, then it matters a lot when we look across the genome, we say, you know, I see 3 million single nucleotide differences between any two humans. What proportion of those are driven by selection? Or what proportion of those just happen to be affected by selection on mutations that are occurring nearby? Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it matters. Yep. You know, maybe help us also to unpack a little bit this idea, which I think is sort of a central part of the neutral theory, um, is this idea of an equilibrium between mutation and drift. What does that mean? Right. So um, Kimura was so uh, how to explain um kimura was really trying to explain two different patterns so one is you look at two species and you see some number of differences between them so you can kind of think of that as the differences that have accumulated over time and one is the differences within a population how many differences are there how many variant sites are there what are the frequencies of those variant sites and the neutral if all of the mutations are neutral and there's no other kind of selection perturbing things, then neutral models let you predict exactly how frequent mutations should be as a population of mutations, not each individual one. So we can say that most mutations should be at low frequency because mutation is just introducing new mutations all the time. Um, and then very few actually creep up to higher frequencies because drift causes most of those to be lost. So we get some some really nice predictions when all we have to worry about is this balance between mutation and drift. And in under the neutral theory, that's all we have to worry about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you start to kind of in the review, you start by just kind of unpacking some of the main ideas here. So one is um, what Kimura called the cost of selection. How does that come into play here? Yeah, so that was uh, Kimura trying to explain these differences between species. And you know, they had very few data points back then, a few protein sequences, basically. There were no DNA sequences between two different species, as far as I know, in 1968. So they had protein sequences for a handful of proteins that they could, um, they could access each individual amino acid in. And, you know, there were a bunch of differences. But Kimura said, well, you know, I don't think those differences were driven by selection. And if you imagine that each advantageous mutation has some cost to the entire population, because for every individual that carries the advantageous mutation, some other individuals have to die if we assume the population is of a set size. That's the cost of selection. Hmm. So it was, it's a theoretical argument. Nobody had demonstrated that cost of selection. And then pretty quickly after he invoked that cost, uh, there were multiple papers saying, well, you know, Either it doesn't exist or it's easy to get around if you just invoke a few other things. Um, but that was one of his main arguments that these mutations couldn't have been adaptive. Otherwise, they would have kind of introduced this prohibitive cost. And then maybe related to this, kind of at the time that you also had other sort of thinkers in, in population genetics. So Haldane being one of the famous ones, he had this idea, I guess, based on some of these ideas, uh, calculating that there's 
the ceiling on 300 years per adaptive substitution? How does that fit into this? Yeah, so that's the, the cost, right? You, you would basically drive your population extinct under this model of cost of substitution if you had more adaptive substitutions than that. Mm. Now, there, there is a limit to the number of adaptive substitutions you can fix. Um, and in recomb- recombining organisms, that limit is really basically uh, within each kind of centimorgan or, or megabase, right? Because you can't fix multiple adaptive mutations at the same time. They'll be interfering with each other. One is going to be slightly more adaptive than the other, and that one will basically fix over the other one. With a little bit of recombination, you can separate them. Um, so there is still a limit to how many adaptive substitutions you can fix, but it's not driven by this cost because you'll otherwise you'll go extinct. Mm-hmm. So as you're pointing out, I guess it sounded like it sounds like, and just by you know necessity, a lot of these inferences or a lot of these ideas were sort of um, held on or held together with very little actual sort of empirical evidence, just given the constraints of you know we could we couldn't even imagine sort of the technology in terms of sequencing genomes at the scale that we're doing it today. And so you sort of, you and Andy then kind of bring that into the equation now, or into the picture now, I should say, to um, sort of revisit or tackle some of those ideas. And, and what would you say that the genome era has really done um, as, as these ideas have uh, sort of been filtered through a more empirical data? Well, okay. Can I let me back up, Nels? Please, because please. I, I think you know we don't want to blame you know all the scientists in 1968 didn't have any idea, right? <laughs> uh, none of them imagined genome sequencing on this scale. And so, Kimura, and then there's another famous paper by King and Jukes um, in 1969, also arguing for a bunch of neutral mutations. Y- you know, they were arguing with other people who had no idea and who were kind of making equally invalid assumptions. And so. The neutral theory came about because there were essentially pan-adaptationists. There were people who said every single amino acid polymorphism you see, that must be balanced. There's balancing selection acting on it. Every single difference you see between species, that must be an adaptive change. And so I think Kimura and King and Jukes, even though some of the theoretical arguments don't really hold up anymore, they were making a really important point that there can be alleles that are equivalent in fitness. And if we think about their dynamics, they can be quite different than just purely adaptive or or balanced polymorphisms. And so it it was really important. And I think it it really did change a lot of minds and took people away from that slightly even stranger (laughs) pan-adaptationism movement um, that had been occurring earlier in the 60s. So in that sense, I think it was important. It, It did lay the groundwork for lots of the molecular work that came next. Mm-hmm. Um, well, okay. no, I, yeah. absolutely. And I'd, actually, I'd love to sort of dig in a little bit on the adaptionist sort of viewpoint, because I think, you know, as you're saying, there is that sort of extreme view in the 60s. Up, but I would say for a generation of molecular biologists, maybe cell biologists, that uh, sort of training in the um, under sort of the, um, you know, regime of genetic screens, all of the mutations you pick out from a uh, genetic screen is likely adaptive. I mean, that's the whole idea the fe- that you're going after a phenotype. And so in some ways, I think that moved the thinking back, at least for experimental biologists in, in working in sort of empirical space, that everything is adaptive. And so you end up with, um, you know, what's kind of become a little bit of an argument of adaptionists versus neutralists. And I'm curious your impressions of that. Um, I think, I, I don't know the molecular biology world so well i would say that i'm a pan selectionist (laughs) Um, (laughs) and you know that is that there's there's there are certainly neutral mutations like i i don't i'm not denying that but i think that for evolutionary biology it doesn't help to assume that all mutations are neutral or that we can ignore the effects of selection and I think that's really how our world was shaped. I, I don't know, yeah. you know, how much we as population genesis are affected by what the molecular biologists are finding, right? It it comes from a very theoretical uh, worldview, not like more informed just because molecular biologists are making all of these new discoveries. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, so one of the examples that um, I thought was really fascinating, so um, – Eugene Kunin, who's at the NIH and has been, he's been a guest a few times, hasn't he, Vincent, on This Week in Virology, Twiv? 
think he's been once. Yeah. Okay. Yep. He had a review not too long ago. Um, I think the title is, uh, oh yeah, I've got it here. Splendor and the misery of adaptation <laughs> or the importance of neutral null for understanding evolution. <laughs> and this gets a little bit, I think to what you're, you just mentioned, um, uh, uh, uh Matt, a, a little bit ago is sort of the difficulty of thinking of the neutral model as a null hypothesis. Um, and in fact, this, um, you know, kind of, I think there's a, a little bit of a dust up here, um, which I'm trying to kind of highlight a little bit is how do we even have a conversation sort of across field? So Eugene Koonin is a, um, a virologist by training, um, thinks a lot kind of on genome scale and a little bit on, uh, in evolution as well. But this is a little bit of a dust up um, for thinking about whether um, some of the ideas from neutral theory or related things were sort of being kind of misinterpreted or misrepresented. Do you, did you, did you come across that at all? Yes. I haven't read uh, Eugene's uh, review that one, but I, I think there's often this yeah. conflation between a neutral model and a null model, right? The null model is, is set by the researcher, right? You tell mm -hmm. me what's expected. You tell me how you're going to set up your statistical test. And that determines the null model. And I, I think it's really important that, Kimura didn't see the neutral theory or a neutral model as a null. I think he, you know, he did argue that it had some fewer assumptions than other models. But you know, nowadays in population genetics, I can make neutral models that are much more complicated than selective models. And we see that all the time. Right? People generate these highly filigreed demographic models to explain every data point because they're not allowed to use selection. Right. And and that in many senses is not simpler. And I think we often also use this idea of the simpler model should be the null model. But I understand in general why the neutral models uses the null, because it's really easy to parameterize. You don't have to say how strong selection is. You don't have to say any dominance coefficients. You don't have to say whether there's any epistasis. Everything has exactly the same effect. And there's none of those other kind of allelic effects or interaction effects. Yeah. And so in, actually in the review, you guys sort of lift up, I think, the idea of storytelling, both from sort of a neutralist view and from an adaptionist view, that it, it's sort of potentially falling into a scientific trap on either side. Oh, yeah. There's definitely neutralist storytelling. And of course, adaptation of storytelling is the focus of many famous papers, uh, <laughs> including, you know, the spandrels of, of San Marcos. So um I don't think that one needs to be belabored, but I think if you look around, there's lots of neutral storytelling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting to hear that balance. Um, have you, hey Vincent, have you come across this idea of the spandrels of um, Saint Mark San Marco as a sort of an analogy for adaptive? No, I just saw it in, in Eugene's paper. Maybe you should explain. Okay. it. Okay. Maybe I bet. Yeah, I bet wanna, a lot of listeners have not heard of it either. Yeah, exactly. Do you want to? Tackle that one, Matt. <laughs> um, sure. So let me see if I can remember <laughs> this is the, my my architecture. This is, yeah, yeah, right. This is the great thing about being a host of a podcast. You can just keep asking questions. <laughs> Throw it to the guest. Um, <laughs> yeah. So <sorry. laughs> if you have a domed room with arches as doorways going around it, then in between all of the arches, you have these spaces. They're structural spaces, and um, called spandrels. And in this famous cathedral, there's beautiful drawings, as far as I understand, in the spandrels. And so the analogy is that the adaptationist point of view is the spandrels exist so that you can draw these beautiful things in them. And the kind of non-adaptationist, because it has nothing to do with neutrality, the non-adaptationist view is, no, that's just a byproduct of architecture. That's, that's your constrained to make a room, a building that looks like that, that has these spaces. And you did not design the room so that you could have spandrels with drawings on them. Is that about right, Nels? Yeah, I'm with you. Yep. So how do you, how do you make it biological then? Well, you say that the, I think they also use the chin, right? The chin is not there to rest your beard on. Uh, right, the chin is there because you have to have a jaw, mm -hmm. and jaw has to come together and support your teeth and and things like that. And so there's lots of structures in a body um, that are just byproducts of constraint, and they're not directly selected for. 
That's right. And so it's really, I think, a nice cautionary example that the, you know, something that you, if you're hanging a scientific argument based on an appearance versus something falsifiable, I mean, for me at least, that's kind of one of the guiding principles of why we invest a lot of time and energy in, in trying to, um, you know, maybe take observations using tools of population genetics, but then actually execute some experiments that might um, give us some insight into that um, spandrel issue. So for example, if you knock out a spandrel and yet the cathedral still stands, then um, that's one interpretation. If you knock out the spandrel and the cathedral arch um, collapses, then that gives you uh, pretty good evidence that that's an important architectural feature for that reason and not just for decoration, basically. Mm. Um, what you'd really love to do is sort of the gold standard experiment, which is to both disrupt something and then rescue it back um, to see whether that spandrel is there really to hold something up and needs that decoration, or can it do it as a sort of modified spandrel without any embellishments on it? And so I think that really does highlight sort of the, um, you know, one of the motivations for um, taking observations and before you sort of um, hang stories on it to really um, try to tackle with um, evidence or to build a case one way or another. I like what Kunin says. He says the adaptationist fallacy can be costly, inducing biologists to relentlessly seek function when there is none. So I have something in mind, and that is viral neurovirulence, mm -hmm. which I've we think about this a lot lately because I've studied a virus that is neurovirulent for 35 years, but it is probably an accident a dead end, an evolutionary dead end, because once a virus gets into the central nervous system, it can't get out, and it can't spread, so there's no selection for that. Yet many virologists extensively study neurovirulence, but in itself, it's not a, it, it's a chin. <laughs> it's a spandrel, <laughs> right? Because yep. it's probably the result of something else, a a receptor that the virus binds to it happens to be in the CNS, but that's not a place where it needs to be. Does that make sense to look at it this way, Nels and, and Matt? Does that yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I agree. Yep. So Matt, then getting back to, um, you know, select to refocus on selection. So you point out that there have been some papers somewhat recently that are trying to, and, and I think a bigger point is, you know, maybe thinking about, um, uh, or the impact of selection is just how many substitutions or how many sites might be categorized as being under positive selection um, or as being, um, you know, constrained, but, um, um, you know, equally neither one, neither substitution being more adaptive. Um, so there's, you cite some work suggesting that 50% of substitutions in fruit flies, for instance, might be fixed by positive selection. How's that calculated? What's that based on? So, um, that is based on a test called the McDonald Kreitman test. That's almost where almost all of those numbers come from. And essentially, uh, if you have an adaptive, the way it works is you have an, if you have an adaptive substitution, an adaptive allele that arises, it's going to be polymorphic for a very short amount of time, right? If it's really advantageous, it's going to just sweep through the population quite quickly, and everyone in the end will have that allele. And so you're really unlikely to sample adaptive alleles in a population, right? Like that are still polymorphic. And so the idea of the McDonald Kreitman test is those adaptive substitutions keep accumulating and you can measure them when you compare two species, but you're not going to see them when you look within a species. And so it allows you to essentially use data from within a species as a kind of a null model and to say, well, if I see more substitutions between species than I would expect, given my observations within a species, that's because I keep accumulating these adaptive substitutions. Mm -hmm. And then um, you, you go on to note that there have been also, obviously, uh, a lot of interest in how many sites might be fixed by positive selection in humans. And there it looks like the number drops from 50% down to zero. What's going on with that? <laughs> yeah, so that's, you know, that's... Um, that's a conundrum, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it is very small, but if you do some kinds of corrections, you find a bunch of adapted substitutions. And of course, if you look in human subpopulations, you see positive selection everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Humans are quite well fit to our at least recent kind of uh, ranges. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So you see a distribution of phenotypes that are very well fit to the environment. And so there, there must be some adaptive substitutions going on. Um, but as with all tests, the McDonald Kreitman test we know is going to miss a bunch of adaptive substitutions. Mm, yeah, you make, so, you make the point of the ones uh, that allow surviving pathogen infections, right? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, and th that's probably what's going on in Drosophila too, right? You know, most of those comparisons in Drosophila are between Drosophila melanogaster and Drosophila simulans. Th those two organisms look exactly the same. Yeah. You have to be an expert and you have to stare at the male genital arch to be able to identify them phenotypically as different. <laughs> so I think, you know, we, we say they're fixed by positive selection, but who knows what that positive selection is, is doing. I, my suspicion is most of it is fighting viruses or bacteria or some sort of internal um, parasitic element. Mm -hmm. Well, the, well that, we think the whole immune system has been driven by those kinds of conflicts, right, Nels? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, when part of the um, energy um, that we're sort of uh, investing in now is to see whether it, it might even spill over beyond sort of dedicated immune functions, um, since a lot of this biology is so intertwined um, and can have such um, strong consequences on, um, you know, life and death, depending on sort of the collisions between the genomes, between the um, parasitic or pathogenic microbes in the hosts. But I'd also say I would, you know, like, let's not put it all um, on the pathogens. Uh, you can also, you know, there's very clear cases where reproductive outcomes and competition there um, also have um obvious and very um, sort of clear fitness consequences as well. About skin color. Yeah. So in all kind of environmental one, um, stressors and yep. Well, paper we and, did a couple of weeks, months ago, right? Correct. Yeah. Talking to Sarah Tishkoff on um, Twivo about some of that work. Um, I think other, you know, examples that you could hold up are um, populations of humans that live at high elevations for any mm. amount of time. Um, and just as Matt's saying that there are these, um, sort of clear, um, cases where you can kind of see, um, well, so certainly you can start to do the storytelling on the adaptive cases, but then actually build, uh, evidence, um, in, in sort of empirical approach as well to see how this could be adaptive given the environmental differences, um, where, um, people find themselves distributed around the world. Well, Sarah is also famous, um, for the lactase persistence alleles. So the mm -hmm. um, domestication of some sort of uh, dairy producing mm. uh, animals has uh, gone along with the origin of multiple different mutations that have allowed the lactase enzyme to continue to be expressed in adulthood. Mm. So that's, you know, a, an extreme example of matching a very localized environment, the environment being this domesticated cow or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So, and so far, Matt, we've been talking kind of about substitutions, meaning kind of simple point mutations, amino acid or point uh, nucleic acid uh, changes, A's to T's, G's to C's, so on and so forth. But you also raise in the review the importance of recombination and how that can influence levels of polymorphism. Um, there's a figure that you talk about this measure tau. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, so this has to do with now we're, let's look within a species, and the neutral theory says if everything's neutral, then we can predict how much polymorphism there is. And mm -hmm. part of that set of predictions is that there shouldn't be a correlation between recombination rate and level of polymorphism, the number of alleles you see in a population. And so there's two possible explanations if you do see this correlation, and that's what that figure our only figure shows there is a correlation in lots of organisms and so one is that uh, recombination rate is mutagenic recombination itself is mutagenic and that actually is true from a molecular biology point of view you are mm -hmm. creating double-stranded breaks and there's clearly uh, less efficient repair at those breaks the other explanation is that when there's selection going on across the genome there should be less polymorphism in regions that are more affected by selection. And if we imagine that selection is kind of evenly spread across the genome, then regions with lower recombination will be more affected by selection because all of those alleles can't escape from the effects of the, of the selected ones. And so the selective explanation is there's lots of selection going on that drives lower levels of polymorphism when there are lower recombination rates. So, and this I think, naturally gets into this idea of sweeps or the idea of linked selection, either 
linked positive selection or linked negative selection. And you bring up um, the sort of emerging idea from maybe the last decade or so of the importance potentially of these things called soft sweeps. Right. So uh, sweeps are, you know, we imagine that a, a mutation arises and then as it fixes, because it fixes so fast, it takes away all of the polymorphisms in the population because only the polymorphisms that are associated with it are left. So essentially you're left with with fewer variant sites. A hard sweep, um, now it has been kind of post hoc named, is when a new allele arises. So there's a new mutation and that uh, mutation arises only once and then sweeps through the population. A soft sweep means either that the mutation arose twice. So, you know, it's a mutation that uh, is possible either at multiple sites or at the same site, but there's a high enough mutation rate that it arises twice. And both of those go to fixation. So then you're, you're left with a little bit more polymorphism because there were multiple backgrounds that contributed to the whole population at the end. Or it could be that you had some polymorphisms in the population and then the environment changed and they were previously neutral or slightly deleterious. When the environment changes, they become advantageous. And now again, you have multiple backgrounds that are carrying this advantageous mutation. And so they sweep but you're left with more polymorphism at the end because each of the backgrounds might carry slightly different variants on them. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I guess maybe something related to this, um, this idea is this emerging, also emerging concept that um, uh, you discuss in the review, which sort of emerged from the GWAS era. So the gene genome wide association study era, where basically as these, as more and more availability to, um, data sets that you could launch these studies where you're correlating certain phenotypes, um, in many cases, um, disease conditions, and then trying to correlate that with the variation at certain locations in the genome. One of the outcomes of that that you note is that there are a lot of phenotypes that are highly polygenic. Um, what is uh, There's a recent work coming from Jonathan Pritchard's lab, the omnigenetic model. Am I getting that right? Or uh, Yeah, omnigenic, something like that. Omnigenic, yes. <laughs> so basically the idea is that for a lot of these phenotypes, there's so many small contributions from so many, so, from so much, so many different substitutions or variation um, between um, interacting, I guess, for a biological process. So how does this sort of influence uh, thinking about the neutral theory um, or thinking about selection sort of more broadly across the genome? I think that one, it, I think the jury is a little bit still out because the more mutations you have contributing to a more variant sites you have contributing to a phenotype, essentially the total effect of selection on that phenotype gets divided up among all those sites. So the essentially the marginal effect of selection on each of those becomes smaller and smaller. And if it, if it becomes small enough, then they're effectively neutral. Yeah, but, what, but what Jonathan has been able to show, at least for some extreme phenotypes, is that if you know the causal mutations, and for most population genetics, we don't know those. We're just kind of scanning the genome. But if you know them, you can show that they change in frequency much more than you'd expect, even when there's many of them contributing to that trait. So I don't know if that's going to be true of all traits or how many traits it'll be true of. Um, of course, all of those those models and those mapping studies are on kind of traits that vary continuously within human populations. They're not what we would consider adaptive traits. Mm -hmm. We're not really things looking like, at yeah. things like height, right? Things like height. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, height can shift and, and that is adaptive certainly, but they're not these kind of huge shifts that we see, especially in other sorts of organisms, a change in pollinator, uh, you know, associated with flower structural changes, flower color changes, these sorts of things. Yeah. And so I guess um, you also conclude the review sort of the way forward. So given just sort of as people are kind of catching up with all of the kind of genomic data or thinking um, more about some of these um, concepts, I mean, where are we um, with, so I guess the, obviously the review, you're saying that in the light of natural selection, the neutral theory is maybe sort of ready to be sunsetted, but uh, what do you think? How do you how do you move forward, or what's what is the way forward for population genetics? I think that the disappointing thing is that I, I'm pretty sure that's how I ended my review ten years ago too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, let's move beyond this and think of new ways. And I think there are a few new ways, uh, but we haven't figured it out yet. So I think 
some of the take homes are don't do certain kinds of analyses without at least the the appropriate caveats, right? Demographic analyses where we try to estimate these very sensitive to selection kinds of parameters. Um, when you assume there's no selection, they're going to be wrong. And so there's lots of people thinking about how do we jointly estimate demography and selection. And I think that's kind of the best way forward, both from getting the demography right and getting the selection right. Because there's lots of ways in which you know, you need to know the demographic history of a population in order to accurately estimate selection. So I think the real way forward is to do those simultaneously, not to ignore one or the other when carrying out these analyses. You make the statement that you want, we should replace this theory with some an explanatory theory of greater value. So what is it that we're trying to explain that neutral theory failed to do? So I think mostly what we want to explain are patterns of variation within populations, mm. which according to the neutral theory should only be due to mutation and drift. And that that's clearly, I think that's the case where it's clearly you know the worst fit. And in fact, if you look back at the 68 paper by Kimura and the papers around it, actually he doesn't really have much of an argument for why one should prefer the neutral theory for those data. He just says, he concentrates on the substitution data. Um, there's not a lot to be said for why you would favor the neutral theory for those data. So so that's one side. You, we want something to explain those data. And on the other side, we want to explain variation in, in rates of substitution across genes, across parts of the genome. And the real question is, is it is there positive selection? Is there adaptation that's contributing to the differences in rates of evolution. If you see a gene that's evolving faster, is that because there's less negative selection? There's more neutral mutations? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or is it because there's actually more positive selection? And that's still a really hard thing to address. Yeah. Did, uh, did Has anyone spoken with Kamura lately? And has, what does he think? <laughs> I he think he passed away in the early 90s. He did. Uh, according yeah. to Wikipedia, he's still around. Oh. Uh... But you must Pretty sure that's wrong. Yeah, okay. Well, that would have been interesting to ask him. Do you think that maybe he proposed this kind of just to stimulate discussion and, and wasn't really sure he was right? <laughs> I mean, I think, I, I'm sure he, he, he didn't think he was right about all of it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think lots of people fall back on the, not that you are, but lots of people fall back on that. Well, he was just throwing it out there. Well, he was just coming up with a null. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think if you read, he has a famous book that he wrote in 1983, summing up a lot of the research. I mean, he, he clearly believed in it. And it wasn't just a straw man or something to discuss over beer. Yeah. He, yeah. he thought most substitutions, most changes that you observed in the genome were neutral. I would guess, though, that see if he read your review, for example, if he could be resurrected and you gave him this review, and he 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 might he must be compelled by the data that you cite, right? Right. I think there, there's a funny apocryphal story I've heard. Um, I, I'm not sure how true it is, but I'll repeat it anyway. <laughs> that Joe Feldenstein, <laughs> another famous population geneticist, asked both Kimura. And John Gillespie, who was one of my postdoc advisors and a famous selectionist, he asked them, okay, if we found that 25% of all amino acid substitutions were due to positive selection, would you be right? Would you consider yourself correct? And both of them said yes. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, Kimura would say, well, that's, you know, that's not a lot. 25% still, hmm. still a smallish number. And Gillespie would say, yes, that's much greater than zero. Of course, we're right. Uh, so, you know, for for any set of data, we we take away from it what we what we want. Mm -hmm. I think that raises all another interesting point too, which is that you know you're trying to capture or you're sort of laying out a theory or a concept, and where it's not going to be a, a all or nothing. Just as you're saying, like you you'd sort of claim success at different levels. In this case, depending on how many substitutions are neutral relative to um, others, like the, it's not going to be zero um, in the sort of revision of um, uh, moving forward with more sophisticated models. And yet, is there like really a threshold? I mean, in some ways that's artificial. And so part of the, you know, part of the conversation that can sometimes I feel like get strained a little bit between 
maybe population geneticists and um, experimental geneticists, is the difference in some cases between what's the overall picture or concept versus a single case or a set of cases uh, where it's just, I think it's worth, and I don't, I don't really know if I have a, a, a firm point here, but it's just worth kind of stepping back and asking what are, what are, are we considering sort of biology the same way or slightly differently to have that conversation? Like, is it, does it have to be a hundred percent or zero? Could it be 50, 50 or 25, 75 to, to make, um, you know, a theory or a model, um, worthwhile? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good point. Um, the, the answers are obviously not zero and a hundred percent or something. Um, and I think we're especially constrained because lots of population genetic tools are good overall, right? We can extract patterns from, I don't know, say the population of data, but we're not necessarily great. We don't have great statistical power to say this mutation right here, this is the answer for it. And so I think yeah. that often means to molecular biologists, well, there's no value in this, or you can't really tell me what I want to know in the end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, an, that's a really important point. I also think, you know, we were talking about um, alternatives to the neutral theory and what they would look like. I think the range of alternatives clearly involve selection. Mm -hmm. And I think that the selection is actually just going to differ depending on what sort of organism we're looking at. I think adaptation is everywhere, that's clear, um, but the dominant force of selection, the thing that's causing polymorphism levels to be correlated with the recombination rate, in some organisms it might mostly be background selection, that's selection against deleterious things, and in other organisms it'll be mostly hitchhiking selection on, on advantageous alleles. And so I think we have to recognize that the set of kind of alternative models aren't all adaptive or all deleterious. Yeah. They're, you know, they're in some sense much less satisfying because it's going to depend on what organism. Mm -hmm. So maybe the way forward is to get past some of the conversations, which can sort of break down into neutralist versus, ad versus adaptionist and to take sort of the middle ground of being a selectionist, as you're, as you're saying. Yeah, that's right. I think lots of them break down along, well, that's just Drosophila. What about humans? Or what about Arabidopsis, right? Like those are the, the other extreme in people's minds. Um, but yes, I think selection in both cases, in all cases. Mm -hmm. That's great. Really fascinating, Matt. Um, thank you uh, for coming on and discussing this. Look forward to as these conversations move forward. Yeah, it, it, this was great. It was a fun conversation. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Matt. Vincent, do you want to take us through the mailbag? Yeah, let's do We don't have that many. Just uh, okay. three. We have one from Alex who writes... I recently started listening to Tweeva at work, going through all the episodes from the start. Yesterday, I heard the episode about the clonal raider ants with the mutant orco gene that prevented their odorant receptors from developing. Makes sense that ants without odorant receptors would behave like ants raised in social isolation. Since ants rely so predominantly on their sense of smell to interact with their fellow ants, a lack of odorant receptors would cause any ant to develop in social isolation. The other ants might not as well be there. I really enjoyed the episode. Can't wait to hear them all. When I first found Tweever, I was struck by how much Vincent sounds like Ira Flato, who was the host of Science Friday. Flato. Flato. He sounds like me. I don't sound like him. <laughs> Another favorite podcast. I would like to recommend it to you both if you aren't familiar. It's a weekly show that briefly covers a wide breadth of... New stories and science providing a good compliment for your show that explores one topic in depth. Thanks for your hard work. I actually did a show with Ira. I went down to his studio a couple of years ago. Mm. We talked about some flu, some flu work. And uh, Alex, you could listen to that and just see how different we are. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have to say, I grew up um, watching Ira Flato. So he, back in the day, had um, a television program on public TV in Minneapolis. Yeah. Um, Minnesota Public TV called Newton's Apple. And one of, I mean, I had a pretty, I'll, I'll confess, I had, as a kid, I had a pretty um, ambitious menu of a lot of TV watching, but this was one of my favorite shows was Ira Flato taking um, science stories and presenting them in a really accessible way, way back. I mean, I won't tell you how many years that was, but it was a while ago. Cool. Why don't you take the next one, Nels? Sounds good. Thanks for your note, Alex. Um, this one's from Kathleen. Uh, a, a devoted, oh wait, it says, I think this might be a mixed mailbag, um, scenario. Let me see Hi, Twiv team. Kathleen. Um, 
Didn't we talk t- about the uh, in teens on uh, Twivo? Oh yeah, we did. Yeah, yep. this is right. They sent it this, here. Yeah. Well, and this is a good cross training. Another Twivivo uh, viruses and evolution colliding. So Kathleen says, "I'm a devoted listener to your podcast. Who works in my lab, or uh, who works in my lab, inform me um, of a recent Twiv that covered a paper on giant viruses that have intines in their genomes. He also mentioned your confusion and amazement at these unique self splicing elements." Luckily for you, I'm a graduate student working on intines and have a paper in press at Mobile DNA covering the distrib- their distribution in the giant viruses as well have, as other eukaryotes. They are truly amazing, enigmatic elements. They have been dubbed nature's gift of, to protein chemists as they can break and make peptide bonds and have proved useful as a tool in biotechnology. In teens are usually found in essential genes and in proteins that perform replication, recombination, and repair, but are found uh, in other cool spots too. That's because many of them are also mobile elements that contain homing endonucleases. They are really neat, and I've been studying them for six years now. Amongst the small group that studies in teens, we are divided on if they are functionally important or not. Some recent in vitro work suggests in teens might have adapted roles beyond selfish genetic elements. For example, an archaeal in teen in a recombinase protein was shown to splice dramatically faster in response to single strand DNA, its substrate. Others seem to be regulated by oxidative stress using cytosine uh, chemistry, or cyst- sorry, cysteine chemistry. I'd be happy to chat more or be a guest on an episode to talk more about my recent paper. Or as well as others like it. Best Kathleen. So this was sent to both TWIV and TWIVO. That's why it's here. But I think we yeah, talked no, that's great. about this giant virus paper on TWIV. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think this, actually, this just came on my radar. And I'll talk about this in my pick of the week a little bit uh, in a few minutes on transposable elements and selfish genes. But this idea that there are these um, transposable elements showing up in virus genomes, um, these things are everywhere and influencing the evolution in really interesting ways. And so I think this is a really cool example of that. Um, and we'll, Kathleen, we'll definitely keep this on our radar. Mm. Uh, yep. All right, our last one is from Trudy, who writes, sounds like a good paper for Twivo. Maybe invite Dixon for the discussion. Can't access the actual paper. So here is the New York Times link, and this is New York Times article by... Steph Yin, it's called This Worm Evolved Self-Fertilization and Lost a Quarter of Its DNA. Now, that is not a great uh, headline because the worm, <laughs> if you listen to our discussion, the worm didn't evolve anything, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like saying viruses evolved. We we are always um, not doing that, Steph Yin. <laughs> so anyway, this is something that, uh, I don't know, that didn't come up today, but C. Briggsae, Cinerebditis Briggsae, and Cinerebditis nigoni. Um, the distinction is that uh, one has males and females, and the other has hermaphroditic females, and uh, big difference in genome size, which are presumably needed for male, being male, but um, we don't know. And, you know, now everything I'm going to look at is going to be wondering if it's a spandrel or not. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's always that's a good go to. <laughs> that's a good go to concept to have in mind. Yeah, and actually, you know, this idea of um, species giving up on sex, I think, is really interesting and exciting. We, so we there was a provocative case of this in crayfish recently. Did you come across that, Matt? Uh, no, but I've read the Nagoni paper. Okay. Yeah. 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 So in this case, um, the cray there's a crayfish species that a uh, pet store. Um, purveyor found uh, basically took a single female crayfish put it in an aquarium came back and it and and then there were like you know dozens of crayfish that showed up (laughs) (laughs) and then you know you repeat the experiment and it turns out that this is now parthenogenic crayfish it doesn't need males anymore Mm. and so i mean these hermaphrodites among worms is a different business because you can you still have some fertilization um there are still fertile males and you can in more rare cases still go through um, sexual reproduction recombination. Um, but this actually starts to tie back some of the ideas um, in population genetics to why put up with sex in the first place. Um, and so the idea of the, some of the original thinking on the red queen hypothesis is that um, you, you actually need recombination. You need sex to, div- to uh, generate the variation to deal with the onslaught 
of pathogens, mm. which are evolving uh, quite rapidly. And so that's an interesting um, idea as well. So yeah, this uh... women inherit the earth. The men, it's it's true. <laughs> There are many cases where you see males sort of fall to the sidelines. The question becomes whether, if you come back in a while, whether you've given up on sort of that longer-term advantage of recombination, um, influencing the ability of uh, lineages to go on for long amounts of time. You could uh, imagine scenarios where things might crash uh, into the future. This, this Nagoni story is in part by Eric Schwartz, who's from Cornell. Matt's old stomping ground. Both of your old stomping grounds. <laughs> That's right. Now, All right. Let's do some but picks. Sounds good. Picks of the week. So, Matt, if something springs to mind, well, I'll do a pick. Vincent will do a pick. If you have one, um, feel free to jump in. You could always um, pick your own book, Molecular Population <laughs> Genetics, as well. But <laughs> uh, I'll just, just putting... listen to you guys, if that's <laughs> Of course. Fair enough. <laughs> so, my pick of the week um, is the inaugural Transposon Day which was just celebrated on Saturday, June 16th. This was the um, birthday of Barbara McClintock. Um, I guess, let's see, I think she would have been maybe 116 years old, something like that. Um, and so the journal, Mobile DNA, which is what Kathleen referenced, her new paper that um, I think recently just came out, um, decided to hold the inaugural Transposon Day. This is a celebration of transposable elements. Also, the, um, the sort of... Uh, foundational groundbreaking work of Barbara McClintock who, who won the Nobel prize uh, for her work using corn, using maize as a system and discerning um, or discovering, proposing the idea of these controlling elements using the beautiful phenotypes of corn kernel color and patterns to infer that there could be selfish genes uh, moving around uh, in mm. genomes. Uh, something we talked a little bit about again in um, driving Miss Maisie, the episode on uh, corn uh, neocentromeres. On Tuivo, we have covered tr transposons are showing up more and more. Um, so I think we have at least three episodes that, uh, you know, think about transposons and uh, as things that can generate genetic diversity, sort of, I think, a growing recognition of the importance of transposable elements. So anyway, that's my pick. There's a link to the transposon day. I think there's even a quiz about Barbara McClintock's work and um, <laughs> yeah, it's great. history. I haven't taken it. I'm a little too shy so far to, or I think I'd be, might be embarrassed by how little I know. Yeah. I, that, I but... did the same thing. I said, nah, I'll do badly. <laughs> 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 Look at it. Both of us not taking, <laughs> can't be that hard, right? Who knows? Well, only, there's one way to find she out. She was tough, but she was tough. I, that's right. But I love this idea of celebrating transposons having sort of a science holiday almost. I like it. I like it a lot. All right. What about you, Vincent? What's I have a, I have a pick, pick of the week. It's a um, short article in Nature. It's uh, probably accessible because it's one of these news type things by Cassandra Willard. It's it's basically about how many human genes there are, you know, in the genome, and goes through all the, you know, we've been studying this for twenty years, and um, how many genes do we have? Well, now it's up to twenty one thousand something, but there's a lot of debate. People. Yeah, now that's a gene, that's not a gene. It's kind of interesting. And now you have to get a little sophisticated to figure out, you know, you see an open reading frame and it doesn't mean that it's actually a gene or not. But there's a cool picture in this article which shows the number of protein coding genes first in 1990 when the genome sequence first came out. There were 100,000 protein coding genes and it slowly over the years decreased until now it's about 21,000. <laughs> Oh yeah, from the from the estimates. Yeah, so yeah. in 1990, that was the launch of yeah. the Human Genome Project. So people were, in fact, I think there were people were placing bets at the time. Yeah, that's right. That was um, that was estimate. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. The, How many genes uh, will there be? Yeah. Of course, like your definition of gene matters. There, it's interesting actually, Vincent. If you look at that, it is a it's a really cool figure. So the number of protein coding genes in right. the thousands, right. based on date and estimates. Right. If you look way to the left in 1960. <laughs> the estimate was um, six point seven million, right? Yeah, six point <laughs> seven million. <laughs> <laughs> so fun. maybe echoing Matt on what you were saying before <laughs> about how scientists back in the sixties, you know, we were dealing with limited amounts of data and making inferences that might be slightly modified as more. Yeah, I blame the hundred thousand on alternative splicing, but they didn't know about alternative splicing back then. <laughs> That's right. 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 That's right. That's right. 
Yeah. And then it came when the draft the genome came out, it was like thirty to forty thousand and then Last count as of this article, 21,306. But some, if you read this article, some people say, nah, I don't think that's right. <laughs> it's tough. But- it's tough. Well, and then it depends on how you want to define it. So whether it's protein coding or functionally impactful, that's where actually I think we're going to continue to see more and more stories from the transposable elements. Yeah. Um, I, I think we need to have a category for spandrels, don't you? Absolutely. <laughs> that's the other 98% of the genome. That's right. <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> that's right. Chins. Yeah. Uh, we have a listener pick from Ann who says, uh, a paper about how plants lost their ability to use nitrogen. So she, uh, Ann sends a Ars Technica summary uh, where they've compared genomes of 37 plants. Of course, plants can't themselves fix nitrogen, but they have bacteria on their roots that do. And they, uh, there's a protein that's really important, or a gene nodule inception that uh, allows um, bacteria to come in there and fix nitrogen. But uh, that's come and gone over evolution of plants. Interestingly, so clearly, if- yeah, really interesting. Really interesting. We all actually, we, you know what, Vincent, we almost did this paper. Really? <laughs> um, a couple episodes ago, and instead we did that neocentromere story in maize. Um, from Kelly Dawes group. But yeah, this one is on the radar and fits, you know, a beautiful Twivo theme as well, which is um, this idea of um, symbiosis and the collisions between organisms. um, But we, we, you know, we talk a lot or think a lot about the host pathogen, host virus sort of in pathogenic settings. And yet um, what happens when things collide and sort of, uh, in some cases, almost these negotiated alliances or biological truces that can be transient um, or seemingly um, can go on for almost forever if you think about the mitochondria. So, yeah, no, we, thank you, Anne. We'll, cool. may, we may see this um, soon in our renewed um, sort of commitment to covering all species from plants to anything that comes across the radar screen. All right, that's Twivo32. You can find it at microbe.tv slash Twivo. If you have an iPhone or an Android device, you've got some kind of program or app that plays podcasts, just search for Twivo. You'll find it. Subscribe. You get every episode, which is once a month for free. You can download them. And if you subscribe, it helps us. It helps our numbers. So please do that. Uh, If you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a number of ways you can do that. And send your questions and comments to Twivo at microbe.tv. Our guest today has been Matt Hahn, who's from Indiana University. And he's third reviewer, the number three, then RD, and then reviewer on Twitter. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Actually, I sorry to interrupt for a second. I just was looking at Twitter (laughs) and looked up the third reviewer who just posted uh, a interesting hint that he might be coming up on a sabbatical. Is that right, Matt? You've got... That's right. I, I moved to Australia in approximately two weeks. Wow. How long will you be there? A year. Wow. Very cool. That's cool. Good place. It's going to be awesome. What part of Australia? I'll be in Canberra at the Australian National University. Nice. Enjoy it. Enjoy, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks for coming on. Sure. Thank S- you. Nels Eldy is at Cellvolution.org. You can find him on Twitter. He's L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Hey, thank you, Vincent. It's been really fun, as usual. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on Twivo is by Trampled by Turtles. They're at trampledbyturtles.com. Been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious. Be curious.